Welcome to uh, Footloose number six. Uh, I'm stepping in for Andrew today, as uh, I mentioned just now. So welcome. Uh, Footloose, as some of you already know, is of course conceived and hosted by our poet in residence, Lydia Kenaway. Uh, and our is Walk Listen Today, the home of walking artists and artist walkers. Uh, this uh, event is the sixth installment of Footloose, uh, a monthly online event using the subject of walking as a way as a way to explore our inner landscapes. And Lydia will read poems from her pamphlet, A History of Walking, and will talk to poets and other writers about words and walking. And today her guest is Amita Roy. Now, Lydia's debut poetry pamphlet, A History of Walking, was published by Happenstance Press in 2019. And in the same year, uh, she earned an MA in writing poetry from Newcastle University. Her work has appeared in 10 anthologies and in magazines, including The Radio, Strix, and Poetry and Audience. Lydia won the Flambard Prize in 2017 and was commended in the 2020 to 2021 Magma Poetry Competition. She is currently shortlisted for the Live Canon Collection Competition. Now, I'm not a poet, so many of these things are not totally familiar to me, but Lydia is going to tell you all about it, or not, but you can ask her. And I, with that, I will hand over to Lydia. Thanks so much, Babak, and thank you for standing on a short notice. Um, the format, if you've been before, you'll be familiar with it. Uh, I am going to read a poem, and then my guest, Anita Roy, is going to read a piece of writing, and we'll each talk about the other's work, and then have a conversation about the places where these works intersect. Um, there may be in the chat the texts, or at least the text of my poem. Um, so if you'd like to read along, you can have a look in the chat. Um, I always suggest that you just listen as it's read. And then if you want to revisit the text when we're talking about it, um, you may get more out of it that way. Um, this is my penultimate Footloose. It's been a fantastic residency with Walk, Listen, Create. Um, I've got one more coming up that I'll tell you about later. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Anita Roy with us this evening. And it's a first for Footloose in that she is theoretically the first non-poet guest, but I, I note that I say theoretically. Um, Anita is no stranger to Walk, Listen, Create, and will also be familiar to uh, Guardian readers for her contributions to The Country Diary. Anita is a writer, editor, and environmentalist, and her latest book, um, Gifts of Gravity and Light, which is a very beautiful thing, um, is co-edited with Pippa Marland, and it's a collection of essays subtitled A Nature Almanac for the 21st Century. Anita is half British and half Indian and now lives in Somerset after 20 years living and working in India. This is new territory for us. As I've said, we haven't done crows before, but um, it'll soon become apparent why I feel that this is a, a very apt piece for us to be looking at. Um, the poem I'm going to read is from A History of Walking. And most of you will have heard a few of these before. Um, they cover the topic of walking from many different perspectives. So it, it could be a protest march or a promenade or walking the dog or walking on the moon. Um, but there are not many poems that are about walking of necessity. And this is one of them. It's called Walking for Water. Walking for water is not going for a breath of fresh air, a pilgrimage, a stroll, a hike. It's not a parade, a protest march, a sponsored whatever. It's not a way to stretch your legs or have that conversation. 
walking for water is not to see an unmissable sight. It is not on anybody's bucket list. It is the flight of a migrating bird, a cruel calculation of distance, fuel, and energy burned. Now, Anita's going to share her remarks on this poem, but before she does, I, I just want to ask one question, which is why did you choose that poem? Well, uh, good question. Um, I read through all of the fantastic poems in the collection and um, enjoyed each of them and enjoyed them collectively for how varied they were. Um, as you say, it, it, you know, you cover such a sort of apparently plodding, if you like, subject as walking um, in so many ways. Um, it ends up being almost like, um, a kind of handbook on how we are human in a in a in a perambulating kind of world like it's kind of almost like uh uh how how two-legged beings exist you know so um so yeah it was it was hard it would have been harder to choose the poem that i wanted to um but some of them had already been chosen. <laughs> so I had a slightly narrower choice, but, uh, but I think even if I had been able to choose one from the whole collection, I probably would have chosen this one because um, it has that, it has that slightly, it, it, it brought me up short. It brought me up short. And I think that's always a good quality in a piece of writing where you're not quite sure where it's going and you're surprised by the way that it turns out. Um, I loved that this was a different kind of walk than any of the other walks in the book. I love that it kind of, um, I love that you, you listed quite coldly all of these different varieties so that we could distinguish ourselves from them um, in, in a quite kind of clinical way. It's not this, it's not that. It's not that, it's also not that or that or that. It isn't that either if you're thinking it's that, this is what it is. And there's a, there's a kind of, um, I mean, the, the form and the, and the content really for me kind of uh, beautifully came together because in that last stanza, it is the flight of a migrating bird a cruel calculation of distance, fuel, and energy burned. There is there is literally nothing spare there. Like it is only and exactly as much as you need. And that's a really hard thing to understand because we're um, as modern people surrounded by so much, which is, excessive to what we need um and and it in that very um sparing kind of pared down way the poem reminds us if we needed reminding which we usually do i usually do anyway that there are people for whom a walk is not a pleasure it's not uh a source of joy it's not even it's not even something that you it's something that you have to do in order to survive um it's that level of pared down essentialness um and and it's a reminder that there is real poverty and that and that water is a resource it's um it's it's something as ordinary as walking and when you're when and yet when you think of when you when you think of someone who's disabled or you think of someone who has even broken a leg you suddenly realize what a what an absolute miracle um the the simplest step is and when you don't have any water or your water is polluted and there's so much going on at the moment about the state of our rivers we're in the midst of a drought 
Pakistan is being flooded. Uh, millions and millions of people across the world have no access to water. Water tables are dropping. Oh. Somehow this poem kind of really simply kind of went to the heart of that and said, this is the, this is the calculation, this is the formula. And I thought that was very powerful. Thank you, Anita. Are you sure you're not a poet? I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's a very, very close reading of that. And I'm, I'm especially pleased that you recognize the sparseness of the last stanza. You know, I really, I was trying to enact that calculation on the page yeah. of yeah. not well, using a single word more than I could carry, or a single word more than the poem could carry. There's um, a question that I wanted to ask you, though, that I've been yeah. kind of intrigued by. In that last stanza, you say you you compare this walk to the flight of a migrating bird, and I I kind of I mean I I kind of know what you're getting at in that. It's a it's a calculation, you know. Can you get to the next feeding round before your energy runs out? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but there's something about it that I wondered why you went for that particular image, because usually when we think of migrating birds, they're going away. They're they're sort of heading in one direction, um, and when we think of walk people who have to walk to get their water in order to survive, it's always a it's always a coming back. It's like these women, and it is usually women, have to walk mm. six miles in that direction to fill a standpipe, and then they come home. Yes. So, yeah. how does how did that work in your mind as you were writing the poem? I, th I think I was thinking of the long term round trip, um, and and just in terms of of getting there getting what they need and and returning. Mm. Um, I suppose flight may seem easy if you're earthbound. Right. Um, and perhaps that provides a sort of false hope in the poem. Um, yeah, that, that's, I don't that's know. all. I don't know. I like that there weren't, I like that it was a poem about poverty and about real people, but there is no mention of poverty or real people in it. I really tried to avoid hitting my reader over the head with, <laughs> um, it, it's so much more meaningful if, if it sort of unfolds in front of you instead of, you know, having a neon sign arrow pointing to what, what you're trying to say. And I wanted to put it in the context of, of privilege, mm -hmm. which is why that list and, and, you know, the bucket list, I allow myself a macabre joke there. Um, yeah. You, you know, the, the bucket lists are things people with too much time and money on their hands can worry about. Um, so it, it is an attempt to, to say what I have to say by not saying it. You know, by, by, I think if I tried to, well, if I tried to depict, I for one haven't seen real poverty and it would be disingenuous of me to try to paint a picture of it. I, I can only imagine from a position of privilege, and that's what I'm hoping the, the poem is doing. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. I mean, I was, uh, have you come across the, are they called the Hot Poets? Ah, are they called the Hot Poets? It's poem, poet, poets who are writing specifically to do with climate change. Um, Oh, it was one of those things that one Googles and then you forget. Oh, and, oh but it, I'll have a look. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I think it, it, it just made me particularly in context of this poem and what you were just saying about mm -hmm. um, how do you approach issues, how do you approach issues actually in poetry? Yeah with poetry yeah. are you yeah. are you trying to um just raise awareness are you trying to persuade are you trying to shock are you trying to activate are you trying to inspire are you trying to what is yeah. it that yes an issue an issue type poem yeah you know? i think it's i think it's a mistake to try to instruct i, I think instruction is not um in the remit of poetry um I think discovery is, and you know there is a subtle difference. Um, yeah, I think we'd better move on because we would really love to hear the beginning of this piece of writing from Gifts of Gravity and Light. Well, thank you. For that, I have to change into my old lady glasses, my old lady reading glasses. <laughs> Ah, okay, so this uh, is the opening of the chapter that I have in the book. Um, as Lydia mentioned, it's an almanac. So uh, each of the writers um, takes one season. We have 12 um, chapters in uh, uh, four, okay, so three, three writers per season for the four seasons. And Pippa and I, as editors, um, decided that we would do the equinoxes, the equinoctial hinges of the book. So I chose the autumn equinox. There you go, hot poets. Thank you, Emma. Live talk, check them out. I think that's really interesting. Um, so I will just read the opening of my uh, chapter, which you'll notice is not poetry, but it is. Um, it is what it is. Let me just stop waffling and read it to you. Um, 21st of September, 2020, 7.08 a.m. I turn off the radio, stopping the grim newsreader mid-sentence. I can't bear any more statistics. I lace up my walking boots and put on a jacket, head full of graphs and scales and tipping points. I need to get to the field. As I leave the pavements behind, the sky lightens and the mists begin to lift. Today promises to be one of those glorious muted trumpet days. The black downhills unfurling against a royal blue, black, blue backdrop like a heraldic flag embroidered in gold and beige. One of those days when autumn just wins, hands down. Spring with her shy blossoms, summer all lazy and gorgeous, stern-faced winter with ice chips for eyes. They don't stand a chance. Autumn on a day like this is a full body experience. The lane is thick with fallen leaves and they look like they feel crisp and biscuity and they sound like they smell like crushed chestnuts and bonfire smoke. It's a nostalgic hit to all five senses, sending me reeling back until I'm a child again, a little girl in a scratchy duffel coat with mittens on a ribbon threaded through the arms in a body that has only experienced four or five circuits of our nearest star. Over the stile, the footpath leads straight across a farmer's field where until a few weeks back, maize had towered over my head blocking the view. Now, Rows of dry stalks stretch away from my mud caked boots to vanishing points along the brow of the hill, corn soldiers slain in a populous field. I'm heading due west with the sun at my back, walking into my elongated shadow as though my shadow self is leading me on, falling into an easy rhythm, left, right, left, right, literally setting my own pace. Walking like this lulls and awakens simultaneously. I wonder if that's why hypnotists use a swinging watch, a pendulum, a metronome. It's just something about that regular rhythm allows the mind to slip the reins, lower the defenses, and let strange thoughts arise unbidden. Ruttam and Satyam, 
Sanskrit words, both translatable as truth, but whereas satyam is expressible and is personal, as in my truth, the truth of rhythm refers to the underlying order of things. It is impersonal and cannot be spoken about. Rhythm is etymologically linked to the English word rhythm. And I found myself wondering about the beat of the heart or of the earth, those anagrammed twins, the season's annual boom and bust, the circling earth, the breathing in and out, in and out, left, right, left, right. I trudge on up the slope towards the woods and in my vaguely dissociated state of mind, it feels as though it's me that's causing the planet to turn on its axis. Each step does not so much propel me forward as push the earth back. I feel like a very small hamster on a very large wheel, dialing up the sun. Thank you. I don't know if Lydia's frozen or whether my deathless prose has <laughs> caused the internet to crash. <laughs> that would be a, I think she may have frozen. Lydia, are you there? Uh, video has frozen. Ah, there we Can are. Can you, uh, right, <laughs> am I back? I may have to, look, if, it, if I freeze again, um, I may just go closer to my router and see what happens, but the, this is a first for Footloose, so I guess it's pretty good we've got this far. Uh, maybe I should just talk quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start, it, it may sound a little negative, but I'll, I'm going to start by saying what I don't usually like about prose, because I tend to approach it impatiently. I approach it as a poet. And the first thing that bugs me is that it's usually verbose and it's usually two dimensional. Mm. And it usually starts at the beginning and finishes at the end. Um, so verbosity, this passage, we're accompanying the reader, the speaker on a walk and the pace seems entirely Uh oh, Lydia, I think you have to go nearer your router. Router. You can hear me, but where are my notes? Yes, so I was talking about the things that usually bug me about mm -hmm. prose, and one is verbosity. I, I keep thinking, really, you could have said that in you know half the number of words. Yeah. And the, the second thing was, Two dimensionality. And the third thing is beginning at the, you know, it's it's predictable, it begins at the beginning and ends at the end. This does not do that. <laughs> I want to say straight away. Um, the, the pace seems absolutely appropriate for the subject. We're walking at your side. Um, in terms of two dimensionalities, your descriptions are just anything but flat. Um, when you describe the dry stalks of corn as corn soldiers um, slain in a populous field, the word populous is so freighted with meaning that the harvesting of a corn crop becomes young men cut down in their prime in, in war and the field isn't just any field, but it's you know some some corner of a foreign field. Suddenly, just by using the word populace, you invoke the war poets to me, and the expected deaths of autumn take on this sinister turn. Um, and this is where we get to your use of time. So. The opening sentence, what was it? Um, I turn off the radio, stopping the grim newsreader mid-sentence. Well, I hear Grim Reaper. And 
here we're in this cornfield and you're invoking so much and taking us back to that beginning and thinking, oh, did I mishear that? Did I? It's it's really marvelous. It's just, it's wonderful writing. Even the word sentence, you know, mid-sentence, that is paired with death. It's it's really remarkable. Um, I would love to take the time to talk about rhythm and and how we are built to pulse and how that inner pulse affects the way we perceive alterations to rhythms around us because that is one of the you know basics of music and poetry but I haven't got the time and not everybody has the geeky interest that I have in <laughs> word origins <laughs> um, your final image in the passage reads, it feels as though it's me that's causing the planet to turn on its axis. Each step does not so much propel me forward as push the earth back. <coughs> now, a few a couple of months ago on, on Footloose, I read a poem called Dale's Way. And in that I have, if I can find it, a line. Yes. In the Dale's way, I wrote, the rhythm of our boots resonated upwards until it was less like walking, more like riding a wide wave. So we were sharing this experience yeah. of walking where you don't feel you're moving or, or you're making the, the landscape around you move. It's, it's a really remarkable but, but shared experience and the other thing I liked about although I said I wouldn't talk about it too much about the the passage about about rhythm is that it doesn't feel like a detour and it it's the way we think when we're walking mm. that we our mind is liberated and goes off on all kinds of tangents and you give us that experience within the writing, which I think is very beautiful. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm uh, glad that you, I'm glad that you feel all that. And I'm, I'm especially surprised and gladdened that you can find um, the kind of uh, textures of mortality and death in there because that's something that I hadn't really, I mean, when I was writing it, I was, wasn't doing that consciously, but it's the, um, the key thing for me that seems to come through all my writing, whether I'm intending it or not, is to do with death. It just is the big thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's what gives life its quality, its meaning, it's, it's everything really. Yes. Um, and so yeah when when you're when you're pointing those things out to me in my own writing i, I i'm slightly rocked back on my heels say, oh my god yes you're right you're right you're right i i didn't yeah i hadn't twigged that before the yeah and this, of course, when i was writing it we were in the midst of um the the pandemic and 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 everything was um, there was a lot of panic um, and fear and loss and grief and that made everything feel kind of sharper and more alive. Mm -hmm. And that's also what I think what I wanted to write about in the um, in the piece that I did and, and one of the reasons why uh, I chose the autumn equinox rather than the spring one because I've always just loved the kind of poignant sadness and fadingness of autumn that we're just on the cusp of now you know we're just kind of getting into that yes. sad nostalgic fading um, I just find it immensely poignant when and all those years that I lived in India um, 
I really missed like a proper autumn. I mean, yes. I, I was I was born there, but I grew up here. So a lot of my childhood memories, that little girl with her duffel coat and all of that, they're of English seasons mm -hmm. and and British weather. And um the you experience the weather very differently in India. So the the monsoon which is going on at the moment um is a relief huge relief you know sort of celebratory relief from the hot 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 dry weather that had preceding it and there's this looking forward to the coolness of the winter that that comes on a little later in the year but um there's something there's something about autumn which just really kind of gets under my skin and i think it's to do with mortality and cycles Yes, yes, yeah. Well, that, that I think you've expressed it beautifully, and, and I hope you know people will get hold of the book and read the entire piece, or read the entire well, book. I should read, read the whole book, you know. <laughs> Don't you? Um, uh, and and I, I have to admit, I think I have been unfair on prose. You know that that perhaps my attention span has shrunk in writing poetry. <laughs> I, you know, I think that some of the most, um, uh, some of the most brilliant, insightful, evocative, sharp, surprising, important, beautiful writing that's being done at the moment, um, at least I think in this part of the world, is I think in nature writing, yes. and what and what this book I mean this book is the 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 subtitle is a nature almanac for the twenty first century and what we wanted to do was to um, bring voices to the genre who who don't normally who wouldn't think of themselves mm -hmm. as nature writers necessarily yes and and you've, got, you've got testament we've got testament who's a beatboxer we've got um, we've got people like um, Rain Gagan and Michael Malley and we've got, but the whole thing is um, very poetic also in its, in its everything. The, the, the collection is shot through with poetry um, and the title itself is a quote from a Simon Armitage poem. Um, so Gifts of Gravity and Light is from a poem. It's Pre it's prefaced with a poem by um, Jackie Kay, and it's kind of bookended with another poem, but mm -hmm. another section of poetry from Simon oh. Armitage. And I think the definitions are just very blurry. blurry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. Which is a very good thing, I think. I think so. I mean, I I know I keep finding myself in um, company like this. Where we're talking about poems and we're talking about poetry and I I find myself um, constantly surprised that I'm included in this because although I have had some poems published I don't think of myself as a poet and I find writing poetry really really hard. Really you've hard. just done it. <laughs> you've just proven that you are a poet. <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't know maybe it's just maybe we shouldn't think too much in terms of boundaries. Maybe we yeah. should think in terms of what is it that I'm trying to communicate and how, what vehicle do I, is the best one for this thought. Exactly. Yes. And I think that your poem, you know, the, the one that we started with, it's such a perfect, uh, it's, it's the right, the, like the form just completely matches the, um, what it is that it's saying there's just it's just like this perfect shape pared down exactly what it needs to be if you'd done that in a piece of prose it would, yeah. it would just not be the you know it would just i don't know this wouldn't and, be the, and i'm incapable of writing more than 50 words on a page anyway so <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have happened <laughs> um i think we are getting close to our time because I, I would like to just say a few things unless is there something else you'd like to say Anita before I wrap up I, I always have many 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 things to say <laughs> just me. I wish we could, I wish we could chat all evening but, um yeah. no it's it's been really really super having you and, and it's it's 
opened my eyes a lot to my um, self-limiting perceptions of, of prose. And I, I just, yeah, I've, I've got to... Let it go, let it go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so next, next month is The Last Footloose, and my guest is Helen Mort, who is a poet, uh, a walker, a climber, a runner. Um, she's going to be reading a poem called uh, Miss Jemima's Swiss Journal, which is inspired by a Yorkshire woman's Thomas Cook tour of Switzerland in 1863. And um, Helen actually spent a week in Switzerland dressed in crinolines, walking in the Alps to um, absorb uh, Jemima's experiences. Um, I'll be reading a, a poem called Advice to Women Walking After Dark. Uh, so the theme here is, I'm calling it hemmed in, um, because the theme is really looking at women's attire and walking, um, looking at the restrictions and the conventions and the expectations and the interpretations of what women wear and how that affects how they walk and where they walk. So that's um, September 26th. And I hope I'll see you there. And I apologize again for tonight's uh, technical hitches. I, I think next time I'll just sit in front of the router. Um, and it's been a real pleasure having you here, Anita. And I'll hand back to uh, Babak to see if he has anything to add to this. Um, yeah, I do, but not much and certainly not poetry. I would uh, be very bad at it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, both Anita and Lydia. It was a pleasure. Um, I'm always, always a bit surprised at how quick these things uh, uh, are over. Um, yeah. um, and, and, and I would be, I'd be looking forward for more of the same. Um, but for more of the same, you have to come back uh, on the 26th of September, as Lydia was saying, which uh, is indeed the last uh, installment of Footloose, which is happening during Soundwalk September, how appropriate, uh, which I mentioned earlier, Soundwalk September. There's also um, uh, slightly more happening before September starts, that is tomorrow. We have, um, uh, as part of our bi-weekly uh, uh, cafe, uh, as a guest, Sasha Kurmas, who hails from the Ukraine. And he um, is an artist who uh, centers uh, conflict and um, uh, the use of public space, uh, specifically in relation to uh, refugees and um, uh, uh, homeless people uh, and how they interact with public space and how he can maybe influence uh, how people perceive these people. Um, uh, so that's tomorrow, uh, starts at 7 p.m. UK, uh, so same time as this. So hopefully see you there, uh, and if not, uh, hopefully see you next month uh, at the next and final Footloose. Thank you very much, and uh, Thank take you. care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.